Hello and welcome to week eight of the Cron blog. I'm going to start this week with an apology, which is as good a way to start the week as any. I totally forgot to do a new book alert for Exodus, so better late than never. Exodus is the second book of the Pentateuch, the five books thought to be written by Moses. And as with Genesis, we don't have an agreement on authorship, but there is an indication in scripture that Moses wrote at least some of it, even if others collated. Some scholars are fixed on the date of 1446 BC as the start of their exodus. Others prefer to be more general, somewhere between 1390 and 1446. We already know where they journey from, that they started in Goshen, really, where they lived in Egypt and that they camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. That's where we are in day one, Exodus 31 to 34. Sabbath is highlighted. The Israelites make a god in Moses' absence. Moses and God get angry about it and negotiate a plan. And God and Moses are going to get closer. So here's what stood out to me. God highlights that Sabbath is some kind of key. God has been giving Moses the hugely detailed instructions for the tabernacle. And in this context, he brings that final piece, that closing statement, if you like. It's not new information, but it is expanded from before. And it feels like, a Moses, this is so important. It's like a key to everything we've just talked about. Be careful to keep my Sabbath day. But why? Well, he says it's a permanent sign of the promise and the agreement that they are making, God and the people. And what will it actually do? He says it means that they will know the Lord who makes them holy. That by stopping working and completely resting, they're going to be refreshed just as God was at creation. And know is a word that indicates both a, a coming to know and also a coming to be known, both sides of a relationship. This rhythm of life is going to be so key to their future as his people and as a community that God further protects it within the law, basically saying, if you don't join this life rhythm, you can't be part of this community. The laws are against treating it like a common day, a day like any other. And that's what the word translated profane or defile means. It's a day that reflects them as a people, a time set apart just as they are set apart. By entering that different day, they're going to live with the truth that they are different. And just as God entered his time and then sanctified it, they're going to enter that time and be sanctified in it. The whole thing has this beautiful rhythm to it. It's the ultimate protection of their minds. But the tricky thing is that they can look like they are entering in physically, but not actually enter in mentally. And the golden calf instant stood out to me. I suggested before that there is a reason why these people needed commandments and instructions in order to learn how to be God's people. It doesn't seem to be every single person that wants to make a God and worship it. It says all the people, but then later on when Moses gets the Levites together to go and kill all the people, it's about 3,000 of them. And Moses asked, who is for the Lord? And the whole tribe of Levi respond. So by default, they are not for the false god. So the use of all is probably what we call a hyperbole, an exaggeration which draws attention to the sheer number of people that were involved in this. And the use of a hyperbole is pretty common in the story of how scripture is told. So their actions indicate that these are not new practices to them. The implication is that these practices, including the kind of behavior around it, summarized as pagan partying, were part of their life BM before Moses. Their old life still has a hold on them. And I wonder if it's because they don't believe that it's God who has brought them out. They say, we don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us from the land of Egypt. They don't see that it was God who brought them, who rescued them. They give credit to Moses. And then once the cow's made, they give 
credit to the cow god. And it's interesting that when God tells Moses what's happening down the mountain, God uses the same language as them. You are people who you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves, Moses. And God and Moses' relationship. I've always read this account of God's anger through the, the righteous anger lens, but switching my lens, I saw something I hadn't seen before, which is why this searching the scriptures approach is so important. We don't look for something we've lost in just one place from just one angle. We go and search for it. The angle I looked at is the statement that God makes when he declares his name to Moses later, saying, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, that he is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I saw that what saves this wayward people is actually that God honours Moses. Moses doesn't want to give up yet. He needs to keep trying with them. And God has first and foremost compassion on Moses and slows down his anger that he was justified to act in. Perhaps he looks ahead and he sees that the people's future is partly dependent on Moses' conviction and commitment to this project. When he says to him that they are Moses' people that Moses rescued, I wonder if he's testing him. If he is, then Moses passes, saying, eh, God, eh, this is your people who you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power, by the way. And I notice that there's a shift in their relationship after this. Moses has always been able to share his feelings with God, but his confidence in their partnership seems to get stronger. And perhaps this is also part of the test. If Moses can demonstrate that he understands why the project is so important, then there's hope that he's going to be able to complete it. And he does pass again. He understands, he believes in the covenant that God made with Abraham, that it still stands. He gets the bigger picture here. It isn't about these particular people per se. It's also about those who have gone before and those who are going to come after them. And their relationship deepens further into what is described as a friendship, talking face to face in the tent of meeting, visually changing Moses as he spends more time in that golden glory. When God wants to move the camp on, he says that his presence can't go with them this time. And to me, this feels like another test for Moses. Just how important is it to Moses that God is with him and why? And again, he just nails it. For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all the other people on the earth. So day two, Exodus 35 to 37, God's covenant with the people and the tabernacle project starts. At the end of the previous chapter, God communicates an agreement with Moses that God will perform miracles that have never been performed in all the earth and that he will go ahead of them and he was going to drive out all of the clans from the land of Canaan where they were heading. The people's side of the agreement is carved on these stone tablets and now it's time for Moses to tell the plan and the detailed instructions from all these exciting conversations that him and God have been having. And just as God had ended his instruction with the most important key for the project, the Sabbath day, so Moses starts there setting the scene that their community can only flow from that apart time. So the jewellery stood out to me. So instead of offering their jewellery to make a false god, they're going to offer it to make a place for the real god to dwell within them. And I remember that part of their preparation to move camp this time was that they had to take off their jewellery, their disgrace as a community. And there's something about God showing them that after what happened with the jewellery, it's tarnished, it represents the wrong way that they were going to go. But when they take it to offer it to the tabernacle, it has this beautiful redemption. It's the right way. And the richness and the detail of the tabernacle stood out to me. At what point did we think that God isn't into beauty and colour and texture and skilled, rich decoration when it comes to places of worship 
and presence? It's too big a question for this blog, but while there is a history as to why the pendulum swung all the way to our kind of often bland and on the cheap buildings, the tide is turning. There's a drawing us back into ancient ways to propel us prophetically into the deeper ways of God. And of course, the emerging creativity in art and fabric and colour and movement and sounds and new songs in our churches are being contested or subtly ignored because God's ways are always going to hit opposition. But for those who are open to hear the truth again of a creator God who created us with that creative DNA, we will hear the call to come all of you who are gifted craftsmen. And if we consider that the tabernacle is not a historical place irrelevant to us today, but it's linked back to the garden that the humans were made for and forward to the indwelling of God within us, his people, then God will stir our hearts, our spirits to respond and to offer. All those whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. The sign among the people that this was a God project was this overflowing generosity, their offerings, their skill, their time. And from what we've seen so far, this is also the fruit of God stirring up creativity in the church today. It's resulting in a greater connection with God's presence. A reminder of the details of the book Creative Fusion that I recommended uh, last week and I'm going to pop that in the description below. So day three, Exodus 38 to 40, the crafting, the tabernacle continues and it's coffee time. Called and filled people stood out to me. Back in chapter 31, God says to Moses, I have specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson of whoever from the tribe of Judah. And I filled him with the spirit of God, giving him great wisdom and ability and expertise in all kinds of craft. And I have personally appointed Aholiab to be his assistant. Moreover, I've given special skill to all the gifted craftsmen so they can make all the things I have commanded you to make. He then carefully lists again what this team will be responsible for. In fact, God reminds Moses of this chosen master craftsman leader and his special his sort of specialist team several times. Bezalel is specifically filled by God for this purpose and his already skilled team are given supernatural gifts of more skill as a kind of hallmark of Holy Spirit gifts. And it was clearly very important that this team stayed tight. It wasn't about training up or letting less skilled or interested people be part of the team. It was about calling and filling. It was a Holy Spirit team. So even though this is very much a community project and everyone gets to play by offering and perhaps helping with other tasks, there's a reason why the craftspeople are specified. Sometimes I think we are so desperate to get help with our projects in life that we impatiently take on the wrong people rather than waiting for the called people. So the excitement of this project really stood out. This was a totally new thing that God was going to get them to do. There must have been such a building anticipation of seeing it all come together. And what a relief for Moses that this time the people had not messed up. Their stubborn hearts had been melted along with their jewellery. So then Moses inspected their work and when he found it had been done just as the Lord had commanded him, he blessed them. He blessed the people. You kind of picture Moses and the team putting together the tabernacle with a quiet kind of fear of the Lord and an awe. But as I read through going through the procedure kind of as it happens, I felt tremendous excitement, like preparing for the most amazing celebration party. As pieces were put together, then seeing how they fitted together, how they looked together, the atmosphere they created as they came together, I could almost hear those exclamations of wonder and of joy, of anticipation at the coming presence of God. And that's not to say that's what happened because we aren't actually told. 
as is often the way that things are recorded in scripture. But I love the way that God has them set up the tabernacle on the first day of the new year. It's a new season for them. It's a new system. And that new system also stood out to me. So we know from our reading so far that in order to literally cover up Adam and Eve's private parts, their shame, animals had to be sacrificed to get their skin. And that this practice became a way of worshipping God like Cain and Abel bringing offerings and Noah and of cementing an agreement with God like with Abraham and the, the cutting of animals in half. But the tabernacle building will support the more developed system of offerings and sacrifices that are going to help them to be a set apart people. Although we have a different system now in the new covenant, we do still have a system in place, a procedure that sets us apart and keeps us set apart. And the journey of that procedure is a mirror of the tabernacle procedure. So when we know the pattern of it, it enriches our own journey through the outer courts and the holy place and the holy of holies, all made possible for us by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So these elements of the tabernacle are not new to my studies, and this blog is about what has stood out to me as I read it this week. But I cannot recommend enough taking time to learn about each element, each piece of furniture and what it represents. So here's a reminder of my friend John E. Thomas's YouTube playlist, Tabernacle Shorts, and I'm going to put the link in down below. So day four, Leviticus 1 to 3, the holiness system starts burnt grain and peace offerings. We've reached the section in scripture that most Bible in a year people get stuck at, including me. But this time, I want to press in for more. What is it that God needs us to learn from it? So we do have a new book alert on time this time. It's logical to attribute at least the original recording of this book to Moses, even if we think it may have involved other people in bringing the pieces together. And it's sandwiched between two key statements. The first is Leviticus 1.1. The Lord called to Moses from the tabernacle and then Numbers 1.1, the book after, the Lord spoke to Moses in the tabernacle. So whatever this book of instruction does, we know it did something to make them holy. God will summarize this later saying, you are to be holy to me for I, the Lord, am holy, and I've set you apart from the peoples to be mine. But in order for this rebellious and stubborn people to be made holy, it needs a solution, a system. And the purpose of God's presence with them stood out to me. There is something about God knowing that this people, his people, need to be connected to the source, to have access to him. And in his compassion and mercy, he is making a way for this to be possible because it's a deep connection with God that keeps us right. It changes us. It's a place of connection that we reach usually through submitting to him in worship and thankfulness and adoration where we are undone by his holiness. We are in awe. We get in because of our faith in the final offering, the sacrificial death of the Son of God on the cross. Without God, we go the wrong way, and that is the meaning of the word sin. The Israelites were Abraham's descendants. They believed in God, but it isn't enough. There has to be this heart connection to his living presence. And my experience is that that connection is strengthened every time I enter a deeper place of presence and knowing. And this brings us back to the reason God gives them for Sabbath, so that they would know the Lord who makes them holy. So the journey of the offerings, although I'm a very practical person, I mulled over the spiritual journey this was for the people who wanted to be God's people. It starts with the burnt offering. Lay your hand on the animal's head and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you, making you right with him. And from that moment of God's acceptance, feeling right with their God again, it would lead to responding 
in thankfulness through a grain offering. It's the joy and release we feel when we connect with his mercy and his compassion. We are free again. We are going the right way. I can picture someone skipping back to their tent full of thankfulness, gathering in their best grain and baking a special gift to bring back, knowing it's going to bring their God pleasure, remembering this vital relationship with him as they add in the salt. It is a special gift a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The day five, Leviticus four to six, sin and guilt offerings and the instructions for the priests start. And the self-awareness of holiness stood out to me. The first sin offering is for unintentionally doing something wrong. You're unaware of it at the time. One of the most common excuses for our wrongdoing is but I didn't mean to do it. As I often say to my lovely husband, that doesn't mean that you didn't do something wrong. Or as Moses puts it, sins by violating one of the commands of the Lord his God, but doesn't realize it, he is still guilty. And through this new system, the guilty person or people are made right and forgiven. The guilt offering demonstrates a call to honesty as a part of holiness. Even though your actions may be unintentional or have a seemingly good reason behind them. Being a set apart people means being self-aware, honest and humble. Wanting to be his over wanting to be independent. To be right with him over just being right. And it strikes me that this process hasn't changed, just some of the ways that we go wrong have changed a bit. Also, there is a speediness associated with becoming aware and rectifying the circumstance and making up for it. For instance, if you cheat or steal from another, you must make restitution by paying the full price plus an additional 20% to the person you have harmed. And on the same day, you must take in your guilt offering. Coffee has not kicked in yet. And lastly, the explosive holiness. The God's attention now turns to the inner community of priests. Then the Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons the following instructions. It's a careful life lived close to the source of holiness itself. Self-awareness becomes self-protection and I think God wants them to have all the details of how to handle what has been made holy so that they will not be killed by its power. Like handling an explosive device that has all the potential to blast through the thickest wall of sin but can destroy the disrespectful handler. So that's most of the things that I picked up on in week eight. We press into Leviticus for more gold next week and I hope to see you then. The Chrome blog comes out each Thursday in 2022 and then lives in YouTube for eternity. If you want a reminder of new blogs each week, pop your email address on the website linked below. And if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, it will be easier to find it in your subscription tab. See you soon.